Rebecca and I met in college, my wife Rebecca and I. Rebecca is from uh, Maryland, near the Washington, D.C. area. I'm from down here in South Florida. And we met in college and then got married. Uh, after we'd been dating for a few years in college, we got married. And then we, both, we moved to Louisville, Kentucky uh, to pursue uh, master's degrees. Rebecca got our master's in social work at the University of Louisville. And then I started going to seminary. And uh, we already had a calling on our lives to to serve in ministry, and um, I remember starting in seminary, and um, it was intimidating. I mean, it was like, you know, it was like another level, and I was like, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit nervous going in there and feeling very intimidated, you know, at just this, at the, the rigor of the work, and, and I remember I got my syllabus, and the particular um, school at the seminary that I was in was, um, was, a, was missions, it was more the practical side of, of ministry and the, the theology and how that flows into ministry, and, and so there was this one particular professor that um, because of that program I would have a lot, and I, I would have a, a, the first class with him of that fall, and I get my syllabus, and I see his name, and a shudder ran through me. His name was Dr. Payne. <laughs> I'm like, is this like a Bond villain or something like that? Like, this is like, what, what kind of name is Dr. Payne? Like, that, that can't be good, okay? Like, I don't know what this means. I don't know who he is, but somewhere in his lineage, that was designated to his family as a last name, and that's tr come all the way down to this guy. I'm expecting, you know, some super villain to be my professor, and so, like, the more I thought of it, like, what's, I mean, is there going to be a lot of homework? Is that what's going to be hard? Is he going to be just painfully boring? Is he just going to be mean? Okay, like, what is it about this guy that's going to be so ferocious, so monstrous, and so I got there in class, you know, I kind of set up my laptop and I'm kind of writing, okay, Dr. Payne, I'm kind of getting ready for the class. And then he walked in. And I, I didn't know what to expect. Like, is he going to be like a mean look, like a big guy with like a mean look, okay? Like, is he going to be like, like have like a hook or something? Like, what is he going to look like? And he walked in and as soon as I saw him, I thought to myself, okay, that is definitely not what I expected. Um, and, and just for your own sake, I Googled him and found a picture. Here's what Dr. Payne looks like. Okay, here he goes. <laughs> and he walked in, I'm like, okay, that's not so scary, okay, you know? Although the longer I look at that picture, the scarier it's getting, it's getting creepy. Okay, I'll take down the picture, take down the picture. Okay, I'm starting to shudder again. But I remember I ended up taking the class. He was a really just humble, gentle, super nice guy. And over the course of the program, I took many classes with him um, and got to know him. Just really genuine guy, loves Jesus. I don't know where the last name came from, but um, he stuck with it, okay? But really, really nice guy. And um, I thought of this story because I remember thinking, okay, Dr. Payne is not so bad. And I thought about that story as I was thinking about the passage we're gonna look at today because the passage addresses pain. And initially, when we think about pain, initially when we are faced with pain, there's something that rises up in our bodies. Our bodies are wired, like literally just physiologically, our bodies are wired to avoid pain. Pain is a signal that something is bad and has gone wrong. That's actually our bodies are wired with that. If you touch something hot, it's designed your body to pull it out of the heat so that the damage doesn't get worse and worse and worse. You know, if you have a pain on your tooth, that's how you know to go and, and go to the dentist. Like, hey, there's a pain, something is wrong. Our bodies are wired to avoid and resist pain. But there's a part of us that knows, like with the way we think, the way we've faced up life, there are times that we know that pain's not so bad all the time. In fact, there's moments that it's important. There's times that pain is not always to be resisted. There's times that pain in our life is going to accomplish something of significance. There's times that we realize pain's not so bad and that the constant avoidance of pain, that actually might do more harm than squaring up with pain when it comes into our life. See, when we face pain, and I'm not talking about just physical pain, I'm talking about just circumstantial pain. When we face pain in our lives, we ask questions. 
Typically, we ask a question, some variation of the question, why? Why is this pain in my life? And honestly, very rarely over the course of life do we get that answer fully. Typically, we don't thoroughly get the answer of why is this pain in our life fully. But that doesn't mean that there are no answers to pain. In fact, God gives some really helpful instructions about pain. And I want you to see what this passage says. Because this one passage, as we go into it, it's not only going to explain about pain and why it enters into our life, but when we see God's plan for it, it's actually going to change our perspective as we know that it's coming in our life. And actually, when you were walking through pain, because, man, I got to say, really, at some point, every, at every stage of your life, there's something in your life that is not quite right. There's something that at bare minimum is an irritant. Like, there's something in your life if there's not just straight pain in your life, relationally, financially, um, in your health, if there's not in your career, if there's not something that's just straight painful in your life, there is something that's at least an irritant in your life. There's never a moment in life where you're like, hey, pain-free. Everything is going at its optimum best. Rarely does that happen. Pretty much never. And so what do we do with the pain that you, that you and I have right now in our life? This passage not only gives us answers, but it actually will take the pain process of walking through pain and turn it around to help us anticipate what God's going to do through that. It gives hope in the midst of it. I want you to check out this passage. It's in John chapter 15. So if you have a Bible or you have a Bible app, I want you to open to John chapter 15. We're going to take a look at verse 1 and we're going to work through a couple of these verses here. And these are some of the most well-known words of Jesus. Here's what he says. It's a beautiful metaphor. He says this, John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now let's just walk through this. I wanted to read straight through the the whole metaphor. We're going to pause right there for a moment. I want to walk through this, this whole metaphor. Now let's get the context This is right after Jesus has had the last supper with the disciples. So this is the night later tonight he's going to be arrested. He has just sat in the upper room. He broke the bread, passed it around. He poured out the wine, passed it around. He explained that these were symbols of his body that was broken, his blood that was shed for them. It was right before he was going to die on a cross. The next morning he'd be arrested later that night. He would be uh, tried. He'd be crucified on a cross. And he did that to pay for our sins, to bring us forgiveness of our sins, the one ultimate sacrifice for all time to pay for sins. And on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. This is in the space right after they've had the Last Supper. Jesus says, the verse right before this, he said, let's go from here. They get up, they leave the upper room, and they're traveling to the Garden of Gethsemane. That garden is really a a grove of olive trees. There's an olive press there to make oil. Um, And on their way, they very likely would have passed by some small vineyards, some small vines that have grapes on them. And so many people believe that this is not just a metaphor, it's an object lesson. They're walking at night out of Jerusalem over to the Garden of Gethsemane, and on their way there, very likely he sees a vine set up on a trellis by some vine dresser. 
and he uses that as a metaphor. He says, okay, look, just stop with me here, disciples. He says, look at this. You see this vine? You see the branches coming up out of the vine that have these clusters of grapes. This clearly belongs to someone. Someone's cultivating this vine to get good fruit. Somewhere there is a vine dresser. This belongs to someone. We're not just going to steal these grapes and eat them. This belongs to somebody. He's standing there and he says, look at this, this setup here. He says, I want you to imagine that I'm the vine, Jesus says. I'm the part that's growing up out of the ground, sending nutrients into the branches. He says, I'm the vine. And he says, the Father is the vine dresser. God the Father is the vine dresser. So God the Father is the one that's responsible for this vine. He's the one responsible to see to it that it bears good fruit. He's the one that decides what the vine and the branches and how they grow, how they grow on the trellis, that's his business. He sets the agenda. What does he want these grapes for? Is he going to use these grapes to sell for fruit, for just people to eat? Is he going to use these grapes to sell for winemaking? What is he going to use? He sets the agenda. It's his plan. It's, it's his goal. It's his dream for the vine. He's in charge. Not only that, but he's the one that gets the glory. If the grapes turn out really, really good, if it's a great crop, very healthy grapes, he's the one that's like, wow, that guy is so good at cultivating grapes. He's really good at taking care of this vine. All of the fruit bearing off the branches, that is for the glory of the vine dresser. Jesus is the vine. That's God the Son, Jesus. God the Father is the vine dresser. And then he says, And look at this other part, the branches that come out of the vine that the grape clusters are hanging off of, the branches, he says, you, my followers, my disciples, you are the branches. And so he says, so I want you to look closely, look at this. And maybe he picked up one branch that had been clipped, but it's still laying there on the top. And maybe the vine dresser, after he clipped it, as he gathered the broken branches, maybe he forgot one because it blended in. He says, look at this one branch. This one's all withered now. Look, all the leaves are brown. There's nothing growing on. He says, look, if you don't stay attached to the vine, you branches, you're going to wither. And you're certainly not going to bear fruit. He says, you branches, uh, followers of Jesus, disciples, or the ancient Greek word mathetes, You disciples, if you want to have the nutrients, if you want to have all of that life flowing through you as branches, he said, you've got to to stay connected to the vine. And the metaphor is that as followers of Jesus, he uses the word abide. Followers of Jesus have to be housed, have to dwell, have to stay put, have to have as their source the person of Jesus. Not a Jesus religion, but the person of Jesus. And have the person of Jesus be the source, the true source. There's a lot of false sources. There are a lot of sources that look good, that sound good. But as the true source, drawing all the nutrients out of the vine into the branch so that the branch can bear great fruit. So the branch can thrive. In other words, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you want your life to thrive, if you want your life to be healthy, if you want your life to bear fruit that matters, it's all about staying abiding, staying attached to Jesus. It's all about abiding in Jesus. It's all about staying connected to the person of Jesus. Now, there's another dimension of this metaphor that he talks about in here. And I want to zero in on it. I want you to look at verses 2 and 3. Now, we read through these, but let's go back here and look at this dimension of this metaphor. Pick it up in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now he brings this part of tending to the vine, this part of pruning. 
And the pruning is something that someone who's caring for, maybe it could be a tree, it could be a vine, it could be a bush, any, uh, it could be a, a, pl- a plant that flowers, there's the practice of pruning. It's how to get pruning helps the person in charge of the plant get the most out of the plant. Now, I have a friend, his name is Jim, he's an arborist, and um, he was telling me specifically, I I learned about this when I was asking him about a bougainvillea plant in, uh, in my house that was not good, okay? It was not bearing flowers. I'd drive around and I'd see these bougainvillea trees that were just explosions of color and I was like, how come mine is green, okay? Like, I has no color in it. And you're like, what's, remind me what a bougainvillea is. Check out this picture. Here's a picture of a bougainvillea. Um, you say, oh yeah, I have one of those. You might all say, I wish mine looked like that, but I have one of those, okay? They are common all over South Florida. They are just, if they're really, really healthy, they have all kinds of color. They can come in a couple different color varieties, but this is one of the, the main ones, just kind of that bright bright pink color. Bougainvilleas can be beautiful. So I showed him my bougainvillea tree, and I said, look, it's green. There's one flower. Unfortunately, it's on the back where nobody can see it. Okay, like, what do I do here? And, um, and I hadn't really done much with it at all. I just left it. And he said, here's the thing with the bougainvillea. You have to cut it. And he put it like this. He said, you have to hurt it. And I'm like, okay. And I, I was asking about pruning. Now, if you are a gardening expert, you've already discovered I am not one, okay? So I am going to try and explain in layman's terms what I have learned about pruning. If you see a, a tree in the wild, like if you're walking through the Everglades and you see like a random grapefruit tree, you might find some grapefruit on it um, and it might be good. But you and I probably know that that tree is not at its absolute best. Like if you get an expert that can clear away everything that's trying to compete with that and choke it out and knows how to prune the branches perfectly, Uh, An expert can go to work on that tree and get the most healthiest fruit out of that tree. And part of the process of that is pruning. Trees often and plants often, what happens is they produce more twigs and branches than it can sustain to, to their healthiest And so there are, if there's a lot of branches, if there's all these different branches, it's like distracting the nutrients and the the energies and all the processes in the plant to so many different branches, it's not getting the most flowers or the most fruit. It's not its healthiest and hardiest. So there are some branches that are not necessary. So you cut those down and it focuses the plant to produce the most flowers and the most fruit on those branches. And so take a bougainvillea. If you cut it and you cut that down, then it's going to produce the most fruit. You cut it back, let it grow, and it produces those beautiful flowers in addition with with several other components. Pruning, though, is important. But I love the way that he put it to me. He said, you've got to hurt the plant. What a paradox, isn't it? If you want the plant to be at its healthiest, you've got to hurt it. For it to be healthy, you've got to hurt it. You've got to wound it. You've got to cut it. See, this is, Jesus then brings this metaphor over to the dynamic of our relationship with him. He says, hey, you know about pruning. God does that to you. The vine dresser does that to you. And man, this this is super helpful to use this metaphor. Let's just zoom out for a second and let's just talk about when, when bad things happen, when, when pain enters into our life. We ask questions and sometimes the question we ask is, why is this happening? We ask why. Why is this happening? Because sometimes life is going, I don't know if you've ever had this happen before, I'm willing to guarantee you have. Things are going along great, everything's smooth, everything's going according to plan, and then all of a sudden you're like, where did this come from? Why is this happening? This is not helpful, this doesn't help me according to my, I had this whole plan worked out. It's a good plan. 
Why is this happening in my plan? And what it's happening is like we're surprised by pain. I know, man, there was a time that, that uh, Rebecca and I experienced this. It was um, right when we were moving down to South Florida from uh, Louisville where we were in school. We, had, um, we were coming down here to, to serve here at the church. And um, it was right during 2006. And so the housing market was just coming to a screeching halt. And so we, we, were, we had a place in Louisville we were trying to sell, and we couldn't buy down here until we sold that place in Louisville, and we were just like, man, this is so frustrating. I mean, we're, we're, we're coming down here, we're answering your call, we're following after you, and now we're just, we're stuck. We can't sell this place, we can't buy something, we can't get settled, we're, we're back and forth, and, and uh, we weren't even up there. We'd emptied the house, and all of our stuff is in storage, and, and I remember we would just hear from the realtor, yeah, we had another showing, no, no movement, and this and that. And one day the, the realtor, so we're just getting frustrated. We're just feeling the weight of that. And one day we got this, this call from the realtor and it's like, hey, I've got some bad news. And I'm like, I'd love for you one time to call with some good news. Could you just one time call with some good news? And she says, hey, I've got some bad news. Your house was robbed. I said, what? She says, yeah, someone during one of the showings unlocked one of your windows so that they could come back, sneak in through your window and rob you. And I said, there's nothing in the house. What did they rob? She said, yeah, that's the thing. They broke into your house and they stole your stove. I said, my stove? Who steals a stove? Like that's like the weirdest thing to steal, okay? Secondly, how did nobody in the neighborhood notice Two people in the cloak of darkness breaking into my house. Or maybe one person just with a hand truck, like walking out with my stove. Like, how do you steal a stove? Do they get it out the window? Like, okay, like it wasn't even a good stove. Like, it was just like to make a point. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, why would you steal my stove? Like, of all things right now, I didn't need that, okay? Like, maybe you've had one of those moments. Like, seriously, why is this happening? And it's like, it's like all of a sudden you're going along and a trial just comes out of nowhere. It's like a difficulty comes out of nowhere. Everything's good, and then pain happens when you least expect, it. and you're like, this is crazy. I did not see this coming. This, this trial is a real surprise to me. See, a lot of times with pain, we're surprised. We're caught off guard. But you'd think we've got a lot of data in our life experiences to know that difficulty is going to be part of life, right? Like, it's not like there's like, for like, if you have a thousand humans, it's not like 999 of them experience no pain and there's just one random unlucky one that has bad things happen. It's like, 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100, every human being faces trials. We've got a lot of data that we would look around and say, yeah, bad things happen, but yet we're surprised. And if that's not pointed enough, that's not enough, I mean, here's what the Bible says. 1 Peter 4 verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So the first thing that happens with us when it comes to pain is we're shocked. And we really don't have any reason to be shocked. The Bible commands us like, hey, just so you know, this journey, following Jesus doesn't suddenly mean that you're trial free, pain free. Don't be surprised. But sometimes we're surprised because the question is not just why is this happening. Our real question is, why is this happening to me? Well, I know that everybody else has trials, but you don't understand. Why do I have a trial? Why is this happening to me? That is, that's my issue. And so here's where we've got to break down and understand trials. There's two different ways of approaching a trial. One is a pr uh, see a trial um, or, or see a difficult time or see pain as a punishment. The other is to see pain as a discipline. And those sound very similar, but they are vastly different. 
A punishment is something that happens to you because of a past action. If you break the law, you serve time in jail. Why are you in jail? It's because something in your past that you did. I did this, now I'm serving my time. Uh, punishment is all about justice. You did something bad in your past, so you serve it out. And a lot of times we view a trial like it's punishment. And we do one of two things. We either say, oh, yeah, look, the reason that I've, the reason why I'm having so much trouble in relationships, you know, it's, it's something I, I did in my past. This is what I get. God's punishing me because of that. The reason because I lost my job is because I know, like, when I was younger, I had this, this gambling problem. And so now, like, you know, God's still punishing me. Like, I still have this going on in, in my life. You know, or, or look, I, you know, the reason that um, I've got this health issue here is, you know, I, I, I made this mistake back in my life and, um, you know, like I, I, I was running from God and running from God and running from God and he's still mad and so he's brought this, this health issue in my life. And we view like the trial we're going through in view of our past. And usually there's something disconnected. It's like, well, how did that thing affect this health issue? I mean, sometimes you can connect the dots and that might be something different, but if there's something random in our past that we feel, still feel this guilt over us, then we feel like we're still like serving the sentence because of some past crime that we did. But here's what this text says. Did you hear what Jesus said in verse three? Already you have been made clean. So whatever trial comes in your life, it can't be because of some random past action that he's punishing you for. Because he's, he's washed you clean. He's not smiting you. He's not striking you. He's not limiting you. He's not holding back his blessing because of some past action in your life. Jesus paid for all of that. To say that there's any more guilt and shame would be to say that the cross was not strong enough to fully pay for that in your past. But aren't you glad, church, that the cross is stronger than all of our past sins? The punishment that we deserve was extinguished on Jesus. So sometimes when we walk through a trial, we say, oh yeah, well, well, I deserve it. I don't deserve any good things from God's hand because of how checkered my past is and what we need is the gospel. But then sometimes we look at it through the lenses of punishment. This trial is a punishment. And we say, why is this happening to me? I'm such a good person. And what we need is the gospel. Because the gospel reminds us, now look at the mangled figure on the cross. That's what your life needed. You have no righteousness of yourself. You have no goodness. You have no good deeds. You have no amount of kindness, no amount of prayers, no amount of generosity that could possibly impress a holy God. You have nothing to offer God, nothing. Your life is not like I do enough good to get God's blessings. You could not possibly get God's blessings. Both of those views view trials as punishment and both need the gospel. The person who says, why is it happening to me? I'm a good person. Needs to be reminded of, I'm not a good person, but Jesus died to pay for my sins and I'm made a new creation. The person who say, who's wallowing in their guilt and shame, like, oh, I've got so much guilt, I'm bad, I'll, I'll never get anything good, needs to be reminded that the power of the cross washed you clean of your, of your sin. So it's not being punished. So now punishment is off the table. Nothing that happens in our life is punishment. So then what is happening into our life, and that's where we get the difference between punishment and discipline. What is discipline? Punishment is in view of your past. Discipline is in view of your future. That's such good news. Discipline has got your future in mind. Discipline is what a good trainer, a good coach does. 
I remember when um, back in, in um, when I was in school and played played sports. You know, I remember if we did something wrong, you know, he'd say, "Go take a lap, Barnes, take a lap." That means I was in trouble, and I just had to run and be like, "Yeah, I'm not going to do that again." What am I doing? I'm just being punished. But there's there's also times if you have a trainer where he might make you run, it's the same thing, but it's in a view of something different. It's not in a past action. It's, no, because I, I want you to get ready. I want your body. I have a view and a vision for what your body could be. See, it's in view of your future. It's, it's the discipline he brings into his life. It's not, out of make, it's not out of justice. Justice has been extinguished on the cross. It's out of love. Listen to what he says in Proverbs chapter 3. Can you listen to this? My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he, what's the word? Him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. He says, I know what you could. I have a vision for you that's bigger than you can imagine for yourself. So I'm disciplining you in view of your future. I'm bringing this in your life. I know it hurts, but I'm bringing this in your life in view of your future. Now, within, within his discipline, sometimes there's two different categories of things. Sometimes that discipline comes in the category of a consequence. There are natural consequences to things. And it, it's part of his discipline. If I say, oh, man, I wish my marriage looked different, sometimes the Lord is allowing you to live out the discipline of selfishness in your heart. And so the pain of that selfishness is teaching you and training you. And so square up to that. Square up to the difficulty of that so you can grow and have the healthy marriage that you, that you desire. Sometimes it's the pain of like, man, look, I, I find myself like, look, my credit's not good. I don't have the financial freedom and the natural consequences. Like, look, I'm allowing these consequences to come in your life, but it's with a view of your future. Because I want to bless you. I want you to square up to this pain. But sometimes it's not just consequences. Sometimes it's just a straight pruning. And it's like, look, I'm not sure that I can link this to something I did. Like there's times you lost your job and God wants you to learn to be a hardworking employee. But there's times that you're a great employee and you just lose your job. What are you doing, God? Like, what have you brought into my life? He says he's pruning. He's cutting back. Pruning by definition. He's cutting something out of our life to make room for other things to grow. It's bringing focus into our life. There's things that are distracting. It might be good things, but they're a distraction in our life. So I gotta cut that out because I need you to focus on something so that you can bear more fruit. What do you mean by fruit? Fruit are those things in our life, the things that really, deeply, truly matter. The things that when we're lying on our deathbed one day, we're like, hey, that, that was important. And not all the, all the other silly stuff, it doesn't matter. Fruit of the things that after we're on our deathbed and we're in heaven and a billion years have passed, it still matters. God's like, I want your focus on that so I might prune things in your life. Things you think you need and you're holding on to it too tight but I'm gonna clip those twigs off that are fruitless in your life to help you focus on what really matters. Here's how um, one put it. I wanna read a quote to you. It's by a guy by the name of J. Campbell White. He put it like this. Most are not satisfied with the permanent output of their lives. Nothing can wholly satisfy the life of Christ within his followers except the adoption of Christ's purpose 
toward the world he came to redeem. Fame, pleasure, and riches are but husks and ashes in contrast with the boundless and abiding joy of working with God for the fulfillment of his eternal plans. Those who are putting everything into Christ's undertaking are getting out of life its sweetest and most priceless rewards. I mean, you and I both know there are so many things that get us distracted from what really, really matters. There's so many things that that the, the glitz and glamour of get our attention and we lose sight of the things that really, really matter. The things that matter for eternity, matter for a lifetime. Those things, the things we leave behind when we go to our true home in heaven, there are so many things distract, and God faithfully prunes, and it hurts, but faithfully prunes and cuts things out of our life in view of a future. He says, I want you to have a thriving, fruitful life, and so know that I will be a faithful vine dresser in your life to prune back so that your life bears fruit. I'm doing this because I love you and you're so easily distracted. Let me put it like this. If you're taking notes, just put it down like this. If we can hear this text, this is what we would hear. Anticipate God's faithful pruning in your life. Don't just be surprised by it. But don't just... Grin and bear it. Don't just accept it. Anticipate it. Lord, I know that on this journey, there are going to be rhythms of pruning. And so when I'm like, ow, that hurts. That one cut deep. That one's not what I expected. I know what you're doing. You have a future for me. And I'm anticipating it. Let me give you three things that this passage has told us really quickly. Here's what he says. First is pruning cultivates fruitfulness. We have so many things in our lives that distract. And he's like, look, you need to focus on these things. So let me just prune back, prune back, prune back so that I can, you can focus on these things and they can bear fruit. You know, it hit me um, about how easily it can be distracted. Let me just give you one of many examples as a parent. It just hit me. Yesterday I was reminded, my oldest, my Scarlet, she's, uh, she's turned eight. That means in less than a year, she's turning nine. I don't know if you did the math there. But what hit me was, I'm halfway to 18. I'm halfway. Man, let him clip the branches so I can focus on what is the most fruitful part of my life. There's a lot of dumb things we get distracted. Pruning cultivates fruitfulness. Here's the second thing this passage told us. Pruning affirms fruitfulness. Did you notice what it said? Those who bear fruit, he prunes. We're like, ow, I must have done something bad. He's saying, no, you were fruitful. I just want you to be more fruitful. If you're experiencing pruning in your life, be affirmed, be encouraged. He's saying, wow, great job. Now I want to bring even more fruitfulness out of you. You're not done yet. Pruning affirms fruitfulness. Here's the last one. And this is the most encouraging. Pruning promises fruitfulness. Did you hear what it said? I'm gonna prune you so that you can bear more fruit. If you're being pruned, take a posture like this. Because there's more fruit coming from your life. He gets to determine what it is when it is, what it looks like, because he's the vine dresser, and it's all for his glory, not yours. But if you're being pruned, according to Jesus, that's basically a guarantee of greater fruit that's coming. So be encouraged. 
be encouraged at what he's bringing you to. In, in view of the fact that almost all of us have some kind of pain, some kind of pruning. If you're a follower of Christ, there's some kind of pruning happening in your life. What I'd like to do is I want to just end our time by just kind of a moment of abiding. I want us just individually just focus our attention on the person of Jesus. And so what I want to ask you to do, maybe you're watching online or you're, in, you're at Cooper City or you're here at the West Pines campus, I just want you to take a moment and just bow your head. And before your mind drifts off to a million things that you've got going on, a million distractions, many of which are probably unfruitful, before your mind drifts off, can I just remind you that the one who spoke these words moments before he was crucified, you're in his presence right now. He's with you, he's hearing your thoughts. And he actually, he brought you here. He brought you to watch this online or he brought you to Cooper City or he brought you to the West Pines campus. He, he brought you to hear this. So what's that thing that is a pain, a difficulty in your life? That he might be pruning. It's not a punishment. Even if it was, it's not like we don't deserve punishment. But the good news is that Jesus paid our punishment. So it's not punishment. And maybe the consequences of decisions he's allowed in our life, but it's in view of a future. Or maybe it's just something that's happened in your life. So now that you know what it is, it's in view of who he's making you to be. He's the vine dresser. He's tending over your life. Be reminded, you're not tending your own life. Thank goodness your life is not in your hands. We're not in charge of making fruitful lives and just throwing up a quick prayer to ask for the vine dresser's help. He's tending your life. He's bringing about fruit that he wants for his glory. Fruitfulness is on his terms. He determines what it is. So can you just take a posture of surrender? If you've been resisting and fighting and questioning and complaining and whining and griping, angry and distant, first of all, you can take all of that to God because he knows it's in your heart anyway. And his grace covers over it. But just take a posture of surrender and in anticipation. He may not have given you all the details, but you kind of know why it's for your good. It's because he, he has a plan for your life. So can you accept and anticipate what he's doing in your life today? And walk out of here with a different perspective. Not just accepting, but anticipating the fruit that's going to be born out of this pruning. And make a commitment to no longer com be complaining about this. But also learn from it. If he's clipped some twigs off of you as a branch, don't go regrowing them. What walk, what do you walk out of here differently? Knowing his work. He's so faithful. Can you believe he loves you that much? He loves you so much that he disciplines like a father. A parent that never disciplines is actually more selfish. They don't want the discomfort 
of how they feel when they discipline their children. It's actually a loving parent that disciplines, and he's perfectly loving in your life. He's so good. So surrender to him. Some of you need to come and just abide in Jesus. I think there's many of you that would call yourself a Christian. I think there's many that would say, I go to church. But the bottom line is, it's just really a religion. It's a bunch of activities. It's not, it's not dominated your life. Your life's not dominated with a relationship with Jesus. I'm not saying dominated with church activities. I'm saying you wake up every day and you breathe in and out the person of Jesus. You follow him. And so maybe you've been a religious person, even a Christian person, but you've never really found a relationship with Jesus. And if so, you're missing it. And maybe today you find salvation in the person of Jesus. And if that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer. So silently, in the presence of Jesus, I want you to make these words your words to him. Say this. Jesus, I need you. I know about you. I read about you. I go to church. I take your name, Christian. But the bottom line is, I don't have a relationship with you. I'm you're trying to use my religion to save me. But it's you. I surrender to you now. In Jesus' name. Hey, if that was your prayer just then, if you're watching online, I want you to go to cityrev.org slash faith. Grab that Get Connected card. Uh, if you're here, and I want you to fill out that information. There's questions whether you go on cityrev.org slash faith or on that Get Connected card. On the bottom, it says you put your faith in Jesus. Take that and put that in one of the offering boxes as you leave. Church, um, here's the question. Abiding in Jesus. If all we have is Jesus... We don't have answers. We just have Jesus. Is that enough? And here's what we know. Here's what we believe. Here's what our hope is. We say like the disciples who are following Jesus. When everyone walked away from Jesus saying he wasn't enough, Jesus looked at the disciples and said, will you go too? And they said, where would we go? We have nothing but you. And that's the heart of a mathetes. That's the heart of a disciple. That's the heart of a follower is that it's Jesus. Jesus is all we want. Jesus is all we need. How could he not be all that we want to need? He's the one that holds all things together. He's the one at the center. He's the one that all things live and breathe to glorify. He is the center of everything. He is enough to satisfy our lives. And we are going to declare that back to Jesus together. Can we sing together? Would you stand with me as we declare that he is enough?